Good morning friends. Posterior ankle arthroscopy is a relatively new uh, uh, domain in arthroscopic surgery and it was actually uh, initially first written was done by Dr. Burmans and then Dr. Watanabe uh, reported a large series of cases. Initially the hind foot was approached by three portal endoscopic technique from spine position. Now with the work of Dr. Nick Van Dijk, this procedure has been done in classically prone position and with this we can do a lot many procedures. So I will come to all, all, all those procedures. Now with this uh, advent of uh, newer techniques of posterior endoscopy or posterior ankle arthroscopy, there are a number of procedures which can be performed. I will just summarize the procedures as, as either procedures dealing with the posterior ankle pathologies procedures dealing with posterior ankle itself, posterior subtalar procedures, then you can do endoscopic calcaneoplasties, then you can do endoscopic procedure for the posterior tendon or tendon tendo achilles. So it has got a wide spectrum of uh, indications also and a wide spectrum of procedures that can be done with posterior ankle arthroscopy. So now we do it in a prone position with a two portal technique. It has a distinct advantages as compared to open surgery that is less post-operative morbidity, a faster rehabilitation, earlier resumption to sports and as it can be done as an outpatient out treatment. The indications, I will just repeat once again, it includes both intra-articular and extra-articular pathologies. The most common pathology is a hypertrophic posterior telarthrosis. Now this is usually a posterior uh, lateral telarthrosis. So, this causes a phenomenon which is called as a posterior impingement. Now what is posterior impingement? Posterior impingement is a phenomenon in which the patient will have pain in a forceful plantar flexion of the foot. Usually it is more common in dancers, specifically ballet dancers and long distance runners. Uh, hypertrophic posterior telar process is very commonly seen, it is a common philosophy or, or, or a commonly seen condition. But all the cases of posterior telar process which are hypertrophic will not be symptomatic. There can be two kinds of patients which can present to you. Either they can present with a, either a stress fracture or a full bone fracture which may be traumatic of the posterior telar process. The second more common condition is called as a osteogonum. Osteogonum is, is actually a secondary center of ossification of the talus. It is posterior to the talus and it forms it, the articulation with the posterior facet of the calcaneum as well and occasionally this is there as a separate piece and this can cause problems again the feature is a posterior impingement now how can we identify it or uh, diagnose a posterior impingement a posterior impingement is usually diagnosed by two criteria one a positive posterior impingement test in which we'll just forcefully plantar flex the foot and do a rotational motion which will be painful that is number one Second will be a painful tender spot on the posterior lateral aspect of the ankle or the heel that is the just lateral, posterior lateral to the tendo is tendon. Now the thing which is important is posterior medial uh, pain is usually not due to a posterior impingement. It is usually due to some other pathologies which can be tendon pathologies or an FHL tendon inflammation or in uh, pathologies which are dealing with the more with the FHL tendons. So specifically by definition it will not be a posterior medial pain, it will be a posterior lateral pain along with a localized tenderness on the posterior lateral aspect. Then you may have bi bipartite uh, tellus. Now loose bodies and ossicles can occur both in the posterior ankle joint as well as the subtalar joints and both can be addressed nicely with a posterior ankle arthroscopy. You can have smaller avulsion fragments which you can address. Occasionally you can have a posterior facet telocalcaneal coalition which can be easily addressed because if there is a coalition bar we can resect it nicely with the bar from the uh, and remove it from the posterior arthroscopy. Occasionally for Hagler's deformity. So this is the third dimension. So if you want to do an endoscopic calcaneoplasty for a retrocalcaneal bursitis this is a very very good indication. Now how will you differentiate this? Retrocalcaneal bursitis from a posterior impingement. So, retrocalcaneal bursitis will be more commonly 
uh, bilateral so it will be on the both sides of uh, tendo achilles and it will be just posterior to the uh, tendo achilles and there will be lot of swelling over there if you take an x-ray you will see uh, the normal fat shadow or the normal black shadow is altered this is called as a kegel's triangle and the normal uh, black shadow is altered and if you do an mri you will have a very characteristically swelling in the retrocalcaneal bursa so this bursa is just uh, just anterior to the or just behind between the calcaneum and the tendoachylis tendon and this is called as a retrocalcaneal bursitis and this can be because of the overgrowth of the calcaneal spur which is called as a hagel deformity so this is the third dimension of uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy that by you can do an endoscopic calcaneoplasty and you can do a resection of a retrocalcaneal bursa occasionally you may have smaller osteophytes and occasionally you can have posterior tibial talar or calcaneal fractures sidal fracture is a fracture of the posterior talar fracture so occasionally you can have a sidal fracture as well which you can uh, do what you need to do is just remove the fracture fact now you can approach the cartilage a very very posterior uh, ocd of the ankle joint is ideally addressed nicely with the posterior ankle arthroscopy with a posterior approach you can have a tbl or a calcaneal osteochondral defect which can be addressed the as i told you the subtalar joint can be addressed nicely so uh, there are now techniques which are evolving you can do a subtalar arthrodesis very nicely with this particular uh, uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy technique if you want to do a subtalar arthrodesis you need to do a three portal technique so what you do is you do a uh, posterior medial and posterior lateral technique and then you have to make one one portal anteriorly which is on the anterior lateral aspect this is called as a sinus tarsi portal and this portal is usually used as a instrumentation portal and a dilating portal now what is a dilating portal dilating portal is basically a portal through which you can insert your probe or an instrument to actually increase the space so if you put a probe and just rotate it it will increase the space in the subtalar joint so through that you, your your space will be increase your working space will be increase and you can debride the subtalar joint nicely you can approach posterior talar cystic lesions you can approach synovial chondromatosis and occasionally you can approach the intraosseous talar ganglion with this so you can see that there are a wide varieties of conditions which can be approached approached nicely along with this you can approach any fhl pathologies also so there are wide variety of uh, procedures or uh, procedures that you can do a very recent addition to this uh, technique is a peroneal groove deepening procedure so you may, occasionally you may have a a uh, deep uh, peroneal uh, 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 peroneal tendon which is subluxating so we can uh, uh, deepen the peroneal groove by using this specific this special technique in posterior ankle arthroscopy this is again a three portal technique if you want to do a posterior uh, uh, peroneal groove deepening procedure you have to use three portals two standard posterior lateral and posterior medial portal and one proximal anterior lateral portal through which we can insert our instrument uh, our uh, bar or we can uh, uh, aggressive shaver to deepen the peroneal groove now soft issues which can be addressed are fhl tendinopathies symptomatic inflammation of the retrocalcaneal bursa post traumatic synovitis pvns and soft tissue impingement as we have discussed the posterior uh, ankle impingement can also be a soft tissue impingement they may not be a bony uh, bony component of uh, hypertrophic posterior talar process or uh, osteogonal but occasionally it is just a soft tissue impingement which can also be addressed nicely but there are some contraindication you should not do it in a in acute infection and de severe degenerative disease and specifically those patients who have poor vascularity uh, of the leg along with some occasional diabetic patients or a diabetic vascular disease and occasionally an rsd patients you should not do it and if you have a very severe joint squeeze nerve then also it is not very worthwhile to do it now this is a classical position we do it the procedure in a prone position Uh, and uh, there is a small sandbag or a small, a small triangle beneath the ankle to elevate it. Uh, the ankle is placed on the distal edge of the operating table with a small triangular support. The support is placed at the ipsilateral size of pelvis so that to prevent the rotation and also prevent the pelvis to slide down. Now there are two standard portals that we do, uh, that we make. These are the posterior lateral and the posterior medial portal. These portals are at the level of tip of the lateral malleolus so you go you go downwards you uh, 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 you mark the lower most portion of the lateral malleolus and you mark you mark two portals posterior lateral posterior medial at the tip of the lateral malleolus 
and it is usually 0.5 cm anterior to the lateral border of the Achilles tendon and the both of these portals are located at the same level. Now the first portal to be made is a posterior lateral portal. The scope is directed toward the first web space. When we enter this space, this is not a classical space but it is usually a fat filled space. Posteriorly there is, there is a Kegel's fat which is there and anteriorly there will be have ligament of ruvel. So initially when you insert the scope, you will try to insert, you will not be able to see anything. There will be a blind kind of a bursa kind of a picture when you insert your scope. The posterior medial portal is formed second and initially the first procedure is blind because you need to triangulate the tip of the posterior lateral uh, instrument or the posterior lateral scope and you mark it with a probe or a dilator or a specific instrument and once both of these are triangulated on their outside view you can start the inside view you use the arthroscope as a guide and the instrument is guided to the tip of the uh, arthroscope now the direction of it should be at the posterior lateral aspect now the arthroscope is little bit withdrawn and then you will be able to see the tip of the shaver and you will also be seeing a tissue kind of a fascia kind of a thing which is called as a ligament of ruvel or a posterior tibiofibular ligament so this is to be little excise you do a, a four or five movements of the shaver small gentle shaving motion so that is just chew away and just eat away some of these bursa and then your view will be clear. Now we will just see what all procedures can we do. The most common uh, indication is a, a symptomatic os trigonal. So we will go in with the scope, we will identify the uh, os trigonal or the posterior telar process. On the medial side we will see a FHL tendon and the FHL tendon and anterior to the FHL tendon will be the vascular, neurovascular structures. So FHL tendon is our lighthouse, we should not go medial or anterior to the FHL during this procedure. The FHL is connected uh, with a or covered up with a flexor retinoculum and this flexor retinoculum is attached to the posterior telar process. Occasionally we need to incise the flexor retinoculum if we want to release the FHL in continuity. The posterior Tibiofibular ligament as I told you is called as a ruvel ligament or this ligament has to be little bit excised when we are approaching the uh, posterior angle. Uh, this is also called as a plural fascia, you just have to uh, remove a little bit of it. Now in this particular video, you will see that uh, ostrigonum will be attached to the or the posterior tail process will be attached to the fibula tip of the fibula with the posterior uh, talofibular ligament and occasionally if you want to resect it, we may have to remove the posterior talofibular ligament as well. Now, so as I told you, you have to release the posterior talofibular ligament from the lateral side and the flexor retinoculum from the medial side. And then you can uh, visualize the ostrigonum and you can remove it by either with a bar uh, shaver or you can use small osteodomes to release it. Uh, or you can use a small peristome elevator. And once you remove it, you will have a very clear picture. Uh, and occasionally you have a, you have, you have a layer of ligament, posterior tibiofibular ligament. If you lift up that layer, you will be able to enter into the posterior ankle joint. And beneath it will be the subtalar joint. Now this is a small video that I am showing to you. Now uh, we have inserted the scope from the posterior lateral aspect. And our uh, shaver is coming from the posterior medial aspect and this is the fat and bursa I was talking about. It is mandatory to excise this bursa to make a good view of your hypertrophic posterior telar process. So this patient had a uh, significant posterior impingement with the posterior impingement test positive and painful posterior lateral tendons as well and will remove all the bursa and will remove the crural fascia, remove the fat. And the structure you see downwards here is the subtalar joint. So you can see the subtalar joint. This is the subtalar joint. And, this. and if you want to do a subtalar arthritis, as I told you, you can make another portal, uh, uh, which is called as a sinus tarsi portal. And this is the ligament of Rubare or the posterior talofibular ligament, that I, uh, posterior tibiofibular ligament as I was talking about. And you have to just remove a little bit of this ligament. This will be covering the posterior ankle joint and if you will remove a little bit of this ligament 
nicely and then you you remove a little bit of this ligament and then you elevate this uh, the rest of the structure so when you do that so these are there are these are fibers this will be passing transversely so when you will do that and you will lift that tissue up you will be able to go beneath the ankle joint so this will be a if you will be able to do just beneath the ankle joint so this then you can use your rf device to release now this release is releasing the flexor retinaculum so on the medial side there will be a flexor retinaculum which will be which will be attached to the posterior velar process so we are removing the uh, removing the on the middle side as we remove the uh, uh, on the middle side your F fhl will be visualized now this is the fhl this is the fhl and occasionally you will see some pathologies in the fhl you can see a tendon nodule there occasionally there will be a low lying muscle belly which can be symptomatic and this fhl as i told you is a lighthouse of the uh, posterior ankle and don't go medial to that now we have identified the medial border we have identified the lateral border beneath it is the subtalar joint above it is the ankle joint and then we can use our special osteotome instruments to just remove the chunk of the bone you can use a bar thereafter and then you can use your uh, osteotome nicely in a way to remove your posterior talar process which is hypertrophic and you can use your arthroscopic graspers or a loose body grasper to remove these bone fragments and make is this area simple now this is after uh, a removal of the main portion and we'll do a little bit of uh, debridement here and if you will do a debridement here and if you will do a gentle movement of the uh, you'll be able to see the posterior ankle joint now this is the posterior ankle joint that has come up into the visualization and if as i told you if you have a posterior ankle ocds or uh, something like that you can approach it with this uh, technique very nicely then you can use your rf device to remove the less, uh, the rest of the ligaments you now the sharp edges of the uh, talar process are removed this is the tissue of the posterior talofibular ligament so we can just release a posterior talofibular ligament also to make it uh, more uh, susceptible to removal and this is the calcaneum this is the posterior facet of the calcaneum downwards if you see this is the posterior facet of the calcaneum when we all, we should always see the movement of fhl by movement of the thumb in this area so you just move the thumb little bit up and down and you will be able to see a good movement of the thumb this is a, this is when movement movement of the thumb that you are moving and we are able to see a very nice movement of the fhl tendons up and down so this is a very nice way to elicit the tendon and then you can just release the uh, uh, rest of the flexor retinaculum if you feel that there is any compression out there now there are some critical concept you should uh, focus on correct uh, portal placement to prevent neurovascular complication uh, first portal is the posterolateral portal and the direction is towards the first web space now sometimes the crural fascia may be quite thick and you, you need to excise a little bit of it to reach to the ankle joint now fhl tendon must be located before addressing the pathology because as we know medial of these are the tibial nerve and the artery and you should be very very careful you should first identify the fhl tendon to start your uh, debridement procedure or removal of the osteophyte process this is an advanced uh, arthroscopic procedure so you should do some cadaveric uh, practice or see attend some courses to start this procedure thank you these are the some good articles which you can uh, refer to thank you